IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 is full of updated and new features for all developers. In this screencast, we're going to look at those that are most interesting to Java developers. There's a new intention to convert methods that have multiple return statements into a method with a single exit point. Press Alt and Enter on the method name and select Transform Body to Single Exit Point and IntelliJ IDEA will automatically convert the method to one with a single return statement. While this is useful for transforming our code, it's even more useful when IntelliJ IDEA combines this ability with the inline method refactoring. Now, if we have a method like this one with multiple return points, we can use the inline method refactoring. The IDE warns us that the method body will be changed so it doesn't have multiple exit points. And when we go ahead with the refactoring, the updated method body is now inlined. The mechanisms that IntelliJ IDEA uses to detect duplicate code have been updated. Instead of two separate tools, a duplicated code inspection and a locate duplicates tool, there's now just the duplicated code inspection. This gives us a chance to see the updated inspection tooltip. Now, not only do we have a description of the problem, but also a link and a shortcut to apply the first suggested solution. This will make it easier to find and fix problems. If instead we choose to press Alt and Enter on the line with a problem, we see the usual list of options. We can see a list of all the duplicates of this code, which opens in the duplicates window. From here, we can navigate to any of the duplicates and see a diff of the code. With this inspection, we've always had the option to extract a method from any of the code duplicates. An IntelliJ IDEA will replace the duplicates with a call to this new method. Another new feature that makes it easier to see what our code is doing is in the data flow analysis. Previously, data flow analysis would give a description of a potential problem and sometimes a solution, but it wasn't always clear what caused the issue. Now, if we press Alt and Enter on the code, we have the option to find the cause. In this particular case, we know that this null check is always going to be false because IntelliJ IDEA has figured out that the never returns null method can't return a null value. If we navigate to the decompiled code, we can see that it's true that the method can't return a null, and the inferred annotations include not null for this reason. In this case, we might choose to apply the fix of removing the if statement, since it can never be true. One of those small changes that makes a big difference is that IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 is very forgiving of mistyping on common patterns. For example, if we misspell return, we are still offered return as an option in the code completion. This applies to a range of common patterns. Here, we've mistyped switch, but it's still an option we can choose. Java 13 is coming out in September, and as usual, IntelliJ IDEA is ready for it. One of the changes coming into Java 13 is for switch expressions. This was a preview feature in Java 12, which means we were encouraged to play with it, but warned that it could change. Indeed it has, and now, if we need to return a value from a multi-line block in Java 13, we use the yield keyword instead of break. IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 correctly supports this syntax. A new feature in Java 13, which is also a preview feature and therefore subject to change, is text blocks. This allows us to embed longer multi-line blocks of text into our source code, for example HTML or SQL without the ugly escaping that was required with ordinary string literals. IntelliJ IDEA correctly deals with editing these strings and lets you paste between the two formats, either escaping values when pasted into a string or leaving out the escapes when pasted into a text block. The structural search feature, which was updated in IntelliJ IDEA 2018.3, has been improved even more to make it easier to try out different patterns to find what we need. In this example, we're looking for any call to the log method with three arguments. The structural search finds an example, so we'll take a look at it. We can see that in this class, there are several calls to the log method, so maybe we might want to change the search to locate all of them. If we use find action to search structurally, it brings the search box back up again. Now we can add filters to find exactly the code we want. This pattern currently only matches the one highlighted code fragment. If we add a filter to the third argument to look for a count of zero or more arguments, now the editor highlights all the code that matches this pattern, which is all of the calls to log. 
If we want to limit this to just the methods that take a string message rather than a lambda expression that supplies a message, we can add a type filter to the second argument and specify we want this to be a string. Now, only the methods that have two or more arguments where the second argument is a string are highlighted. This feature makes it easier to experiment with the search template to find the type of code that we're looking for. We can also see the filter criteria, the type and the count, in the search template box too. So it's easier to see the full criteria at a glance instead of having to select each token individually. IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 continues to improve the integration with build tools. For Maven, the sync output is now shown in the build window, with a tree to the left and the Maven output to the right. This is consistent with build output, which was already shown in the build window. Also, IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 now bundles Maven 3.6.0. Gradle support has had a lot of updates in 2019.2. Like Maven, the sync and build output is shown in the build window, with a status tree to the left and the output console to the right, to make it easier to see what was run and what the status was. This is particularly useful for identifying problems, as we can see the status and the familiar Gradle output side by side. Code Insight for Gradle build files has also been improved. If we create a new task, code completion will help us. For example, if our task is a copy task, IntelliJ ID uses this to make relevant suggestions. This makes it much easier to create tasks that behave the way we expect. IntelliJ ID will also provide code completion inside a dependencies block. So it's easier to locate and declare the correct dependency for our application. The IDE supports various dependency notations and can provide completion inside a dependency configuration closure. One last thing on Gradle code completion. Once a Gradle project is imported, IntelliJ IDEA can resolve the members of Gradle plugins, so we have code completion for these too. This source compatibility option, for example, comes from the Java plugin, which we have automatically from using the Groovy plugin on Line 3. IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 also comes with the ability to create a graph of the Gradle dependencies. We can either click on the button in the Gradle window, or right-click on the Gradle project and select Show Dependencies. This will bring up a diagram of the project's dependencies. We can zoom in and move around, or select specific dependencies and press the button to show neighbours of selected nodes to show the relationship between specific dependencies. It's also possible to show the dependency graph from the project window by right-clicking, going to Diagrams and selecting either the dependency graph or the dependency pop-up, which shows the diagram in a separate window. We can see that in IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2, the Gradle settings have been updated and simplified. A number of settings have been removed or deprecated, which should make it easier to configure a Gradle project and have it behave the way we expect. Another simplification is that when we create or import a Gradle project, we'll no longer see a Gradle settings dialog. IntelliJ IDEA will work out what settings it needs and use reasonable defaults. IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 has the ability to manage all settings via an editor config file. To see this in action, let's create a new editor config via the project window. IntelliJ IDEA now supports not just the standard configuration settings, but also IntelliJ IDEA specific settings can be saved to the config file. We'll create this new file with standard and IntelliJ IDEA settings as comments in the file and apply Java specific settings too. We can see this file is automatically populated with a range of settings because we selected the add properties as comments checkbox. This lets us see all the available settings and turn on the ones we want. We also get code completion inside the file. So even if a setting isn't there, we can find it as we type the property name. To see the settings in action, we'll set two visual guides when we've saved the config file and we open a file in the editor, we see these two guides are now visible. The editor config file settings are the ones that IntelliJ IDEA is going to use to format the code. So if we set the indent size down to two, for example, and reformat our Java class, we see the new indent size is applied. There are lots of settings available and they allow us to specify exactly how our code should look. We could specify, for example, 
that if statements always have to have curly braces. When we reformat a Java class, these settings will be applied. This is a good way to define and share standard settings for the whole team to use. IntelliJ IDEA supports having different settings files in different folders or modules, so it's possible to customize exactly how each part of our code base is formatted, whether it's production code, test code, library code, legacy code, or some other section of code that has different standards. Code style settings are available in Preferences, Editor, Code Style. IntelliJ IDEA enables support for editor config files by default, and we can see a warning that these settings may override the settings from the IDE. That means that if we use the UI to set a tab and indent size that's different to the editor config file, these IDE settings are not used when formatting the file. The formatter is using the spacing set in the editor config file. One of the most noticeable changes in IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 is that it's now possible to commit to version control without the commit dialog. We can turn this feature on in Preferences, under Version Control, Commit Dialog, and ticking Commit from the local changes without showing a dialog. If we have this option enabled and we press Command K or Control K to commit our changes, we're taken to the local changes window instead. From here, we can add a commit message and commit to the current branch. Even though there's no commit dialog, all the same options are available to us, but now from the local changes window. For example, we can still see a side-by-side -side diff of the changes. We can still do partial commits or select which files to commit. We can still amend commits too. If we want to amend this last commit to change a file that was committed and the message, we just have to press the amend commit tick button or use the keyboard shortcut. And we can edit our commit message and commit our changes. We can see in the log window this last commit was changed. Another change for working with version control systems is improved support for ignoring files and folders. It's now possible to right click on an item in local changes and add it to the git ignore file. In addition, IntelliJ IDEA will not have a separate mechanism for ignoring files, so we'll no longer have to add ignored files via the IDE's preferences. The native ignore file handling, in our example git ignore, is all we need. IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 has a brand new services window, which provides a single place for us to see everything we might need to run or manage. This is, for example, where we can now find the Docker features. Like we'd expect, in this window we can connect to Docker, see all of the containers and images, create new containers from images, run containers, stop containers, and even delete containers and delete images. This services window can be configured to contain any of our run configurations. By going to Edit Configurations and selecting the Templates node, we can define which configurations are available inside the services window. If we add applications in JUnit, for example, then we will see all the run configurations we have for applications and JUnit in the services window. We can also move the selected configurations into a separate tab, so we can easily group together related services and view them in whichever way makes most sense for us. Of course, we can also run these applications and tests from this window. The services window is very configurable to make it as easy as possible to manage everything we might have to connect to or run in one place. IntelliJ IDEA 2019.2 comes with a built-in Java profiler to help us see in greater detail what our application is doing and where its time is spent. We go to Java Profiler in the Build Tools section of Preferences, and from here we can add one or more profilers. Let's pick Flight Recorder, which is now part of the JDK itself. We could give it a new name and change the settings too if we wanted. Now, for any executable code, we can run it and debug it like before, or we can choose to profile it with our new profiler. When the test is finished, we can go and look at the profiler data. This first screen shows a flame graph. If we profile another code path, we see the flame graph has a different shape and is made up of different values as we'd expect. We can also inspect the call tree of methods that were called while the profiler was running. There aren't many here as the test we ran was quite simple, 
but we can still drill down and see what happened. The method list gives a list of all the methods ordered by number of times they were sampled. This supports quick search, so we can type a value and find it anywhere in the list. Selecting a method shows the backtrace and the merged callees in the window underneath. Or we can right click on any of these methods and select method merged callees, for example, to show this information in a new tab. The same applies to method backtraces. This way we can get an idea of where this method is called from and perhaps why it was called. The profiler also shows events separated by where the event happened so we can see whether it was our application or perhaps the operating system, for example. A profiler is a powerful tool that can be very helpful if we want to get a clearer understanding of how our application works, particularly if we wish to tune its performance. It may be a good idea to experiment with the Java profiler functionality inside IntelliJ IDEA to see what it does, how it works, and how it might help us when developing applications. That's a summary of the features that might be interesting to Java developers in 2019.2. Thanks for watching.